Hi everyone, last midweek of this semester. Isn't it exciting? Man, the summer went fast. So many readings, such great readings. Wow, this has been fantastic. Well, I wanted to share some current event material, and this is going to be current anytime in the next probably 20 years. Hopefully not that long. Hopefully it'll go away sooner than that, but I doubt it. So I read this article. It was written by a Lucas Manfredi, and the title of the article, the headline is Philadelphia Public School Teacher Worries About Conservative Parents Listening In on Virtual Classes. So this teacher was saying, listen, I know that because of the coronavirus, we're going to have to do distance schooling this year. And all of the public schools where he is at are teaching their classes through online applications where the students are at home, the teachers are at home, and they do their teaching that way. And he got really concerned, and he tweeted this out and had a big, long discussion thread with it. And it's really fascinating because it gets into the mindset, at least of this person, but probably a lot more than just one person. And here's what the article said. Quote, a Philadelphia public school teacher is curious about how educators will cope with conservative parents listening in on virtual classes. Oh, no. What a terrible thing. He says, quote, he is concerned about the damage that helicopter parents, that means parents who are really engaged, who are really focused on their kids and, and really paying attention to what they're doing with their time and their learning. You probably knew that already. Helicopter parents might cause if they overhear lessons on topics such as gender and sexuality. Now, that really makes me think. So what are teachers like this person and I assume there's a lot of them out there, what do they think that their job is? Do they think that their job is to help young people get a great education for the parents? Do they believe that they work for the parents and with the parents to help the rising generation get a great education? Or do they see themselves as people who work against the parents, who figure out the things that the parents believe that the teachers themselves don't like, and they hide within the four walls of their school where no one can hear them and no one can see, and they use that setting to train young people to see the world totally differently than what their parents see. And maybe even tell them, don't talk to your parents about this, it'll upset them, or you'll be in trouble, or whatever it is they say. I mean, I'm putting words in this guy's mouth and he didn't say any of those things, but what is the mentality here? What is the mentality of someone who says, Oh, I just don't know how we can teach the important topics when parents might be listening. The article goes on to say, quote, So this fall, virtual class discussion will have many potential spectators, parents, siblings, etc., in the same room. We'll never be quite sure who is overhearing the discourse. What does this do for our equity inclusion work? He tweeted, equity inclusion work the things that we're training the young generation to do because their parents just don't get it. Quote, how much have students depended on the somewhat secure barriers of our physical classrooms to encourage vulnerability? End quote. So we get the kids in this room. We talk to them about these deep issues. We get them feeling vulnerable so they'll open up and talk. And we talk about things that we think maybe their parents don't understand or that we disagree with their parents and we get the kids on the right side instead of on their parents side you'll have to look this article up for yourself and see what you think see if you think i'm reading too much into it maybe read it with your parents and talk to your parents about it it's a scary article because it communicates and again this is just one person but i'm betting that there's millions of others millions of other teachers just like this it's a scary thought that there are people, people with a good heart who want to do a good job as teachers and really help the younger generation who believe that doing a good job means going behind the backs of parents and training the young people to reject the teachings and core beliefs and ideas, or some of them, of their parents. Deep. It really makes you think. He goes on to say, how many of us have installed some version of what happens here stays here to help this, end quote. So in the classroom, there's a what happens here stays here. What we talk about here stays here. But we're going to learn the real stuff. Your parents don't get it. 
So that's just, that's profound. That's deep. We live at a time period where there are a lot of challenges. This isn't the only one. There are many like this. Many challenges. And your generation is going to have to be the one that overcomes them. And you're at the age now where you're going to be part of the leaders who decide how, well, whether to overcome them and how to do so. Can I suggest that there are three main options for dealing with this? The first one is the one that most people take, which is the whining and anger option. They whine about it. They complain about it. They're angry about it. They're upset by it. They're frustrated by it. The whining and anger approach to leadership, which actually isn't leadership, as we all know. The second approach is the scowling approach. This is the approach where you do petty rebellions. Everybody's doing something, so you don't do it. Everybody's talking about something, so you don't do it, and you scowl at anybody who does, or you don't talk about it, and you scowl at anybody who does. I would suggest that the rebellion and scowling approach isn't any more effective in the long term than the whining and anger approach. The third approach, and this is the leadership approach, the actual leadership approach, the third approach is to use the fourth turning for what it is actually for. What is the fourth turning for? People talk about the fourth turning. The name of the book was the fourth turning, as if that's the big thing. The fourth turning isn't the big thing. Let me let you in on a little secret. The fourth turning is for something. And it's not to suffer and go through struggle and go, oh no, this is terrible. And your life isn't about preparing for the crises of the fourth turning. The fourth turning is for something. The fourth turning is for preparing for the first turning. Because it's in first turnings that we build new things, new educational models, new family culture, new political and social and economic institutions, new businesses. In first turnings, there are more businesses built than in second, third, and fourth turnings combined. More successful businesses that last, that, that, that work, that flourish, and that make a difference in the world. We need you to be a generation of entrepreneurs, a generation of entrepreneurial thinkers and leaders. And this is so key. You can't waste your fourth turning whining and worrying or scowling and doing petty rebellions. You've got to spend your fourth turning building for the first turning. Because in the first turning, which is probably at this point of the cycle, somewhere between five and 12 years away, between now and five to 12 years from now, you are going to become the leader that you will be. You're going to build things and start creating things. That third way, that's where you put your energy. Fourth turnings are for something. They're for building for the first turning. Do it. Have fun with it. Keep reading these classics. Keep going deep. Keep applying the classics to current events. And along the way, every day, every morning, every night, Every day, every day, every day, remember that fourth turnings are for something. All these things that could make you whine, that could make you frustrated, all these things that you say, well, what about masks? What about not masks? What about that rule? What about this rule? All of these things, whatever they are right now, this month, whatever they are for you, that's not what this time is about. Just get through that stuff. This time is about using the fourth turning for what it is for, which is to build something that matters for the first turning. The first turning's coming. Five to 12 years from now, we're gonna be in the first turning and you're either going to be a leader or not. And you know what's gonna make the difference? What you do now.